All right, so thank you again for coming out uh, for lecture number two of Startup 101. Uh, my name is Kyle McCall. Tonight's uh, lecture is on the value proposition and the bu business model canvas. Okay, so these are really the building blocks of uh, any startup and really kind of the first time you translate your idea from either your brain or the back of a napkin into something a little more formalized. All right, so we've got a couple exercises that we're gonna work through uh, and that will really kind of help, uh, help you um, uh, make that idea a little more crystallized, okay? And to start, because it's f more fun this way, we're gonna start with how not to articulate a, biz a value proposition. So just a sec. Hey, I've got a great idea for a business. That's exciting. Tell me about it. I've developed a chemical isomer that links to volatile organic compounds causing carbon bonds to rupture and wraps them in a nanotube coating. Huh. That's a little confusing. Can you dumb it down for me? Sure. What I do is I take a proprietary isomer that I developed with a picric acid wash that hollows out the carbon bonds and replaces them with a nanotube wrapping. Okay, so I guess it's pretty technical. Oh yeah. I've been working on this isomer for nine years. So what's the business idea? To sell it. To who? Everybody will want one. What for? So they can wrap their volatile organic compounds in carbon nanotubes. Hmm, I think you might need a target customer. I don't think I need to wrap my compounds in your nanotube. Well, maybe not you. So, for people who buy it, what's the value you are providing them? I've developed a chemical isomer that links to volatile organic compounds causing carbon bonds to rupture and wraps them in a nanotube coating. You've said that already. This is getting annoying. Why should anyone care about your isomer? I spent nine years on this. I know that. Okay, pretend I'm an investor. How can I make money off your product? By selling it. You're a smart guy. But try not to think like a scientist. Think like a business person. Okay. Value chain. Term sheet. I have to go now and answer that. That's not your phone. I know. So, that's just a fun example of how not to position yourself with a value proposition. Um, he was very technical, right? He didn't really know who his target audience was. Um, he couldn't really explain what that value that he was offering by, by creating that product or that polymer isomer thing um, and, and how the market would react to it and why they would want it. So that's how not to articulate a value proposition. So we can talk a little bit now on what a value proposition actually is. So it's a product's value, uh, sorry, a product's value proposition is a statement of the functional, emotional, and self-expressive benefits delivered by the product, service, or brand. And ultimately, it's what provides value to the customer. So it's not a list of the features, right? It's what, is, uh, what you're offering to that, to that person, to that customer. Um, it uh, describes the value or the benefit associated with what you're offering. So it's the cost savings, is it productivity gains, is it increased revenue, um, uh, is it a better customer employee satisfaction? All those kinds of things are values that you can articulate in your value proposition without listing off a whole bunch of features or getting really technical with uh, how the widget or how the software works. It also describes how the value is generated and why it differs from anything else on the market. So how are you different from your competitors? Uh, how does it change the status quo? Um, why does someone want to? Why would someone want to buy it as opposed to something else? All right, it's supposed to be the short, concise statement, and that's kind of you, you'll see with the the, the exercise there. Um, but it really should just get to the crux of what it is, uh, why someone should buy it, and the value that you're offering. So just to dive a little deeper on this, functional benefits are that utility piece. So that is the the kind of the technical piece, the 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 number of features it has but being very concise with it. So sticking to the functions that really matter the most. 
uh, and this, uh, the, the ones that provide the consumer with that functional utility. So if I got a screwdriver, it's for unscrewing screws or screwing screws in, right? That's the functional utility of it. Uh, if I have a jacket, the jacket keeps me warm, it keeps me dry. That's the functional utility of it, all right? The other values, the emotional and the, um, uh, what's the other one? Self-expressive benefits kind of expand on, expand on what the functional utility is. So the goal here is to demonstrate that the benefits of using your product or service compared to that of your competitors and uh, why is it better. So is it, again, it's that cost savings, the productivity improvement, the revenue increase. And utility probably won't set you apart from a lot of people. There are products that do all this, this kind of the same thing, right? There's lots of jackets on the market that'll keep me warm and dry. It really comes down to the emotional benefits or the experience that people have with that product that make that differentiation in that, in, in that instance. So that speaks to the experience, the feelings that consumer have when they're interacting with your product, your service, or your brand. So we've all walked in, we've all had really great customer experience uh, experiences. We've all had really bad customer service experiences, right? So that's kind of emotional benefit. When I interact with your brand, how, how, am, I being, how am I being treated? Uh, what's the experience that I'm having? So we've all walked into uh, you know, a Hollister or an American Eagle or something, right? We all know right off the bat when we walk in that store who that target customer is, what it smells like, what kind of service I'm getting from the people working on the floor. You know, you, you can picture it in your mind because you've been through into it a whole bunch of times, right? It's also very different um, from saying going to a, a Bass Pro Shop, right? I walk in there, it's, it's completely different feel. Um, and that's also very different from say something that uh, a comparable store like Bass Pro Shop, you have Mech, and then you've got Sport Check. There are, there are brands that, that live in each of those, those stores, but the experience I have as a consumer working or, or, or consuming in that store is very different, right? Because that's how the brands have set themselves apart. That's because the product and the experience that they want you to have uh, is different. Uh, this is that feel good factor as well. So organic labeling on, so if you only want to eat organic, or uh, I'm only going to wear clothing that's environmentally friendly, um, you know, or you know, the feel good, the feeling, the atmosphere, or of a store that conjures. So when you walk into a restaurant, how am I treated? What's the atmosphere like? Is the food good? All speak to that emotional uh, benefit of your product or your service, um, and should be baked into that value proposition. Maybe not explicitly, but you should also be thinking about it in the back of your mind, right? Uh, as a startup or someone just getting into your business too, you have to be conscious of the fact that you are now your product, your service, your brand's ambassador. So me, as the person in front of you right now, I know I'm representing the NORCAD Innovation Mill. I have to, con I have to you know, con conduct myself in a certain manner because that's what's expected of me by my employer, by the brand that I represent. So this is also that too. When it, so as you're, when you're a startup, when you're talking about your ideas, when you're approaching investors, um, your value proposition not only is the product or the service that you're bringing to the market, but it is also you, right? A lot of investors will look at the product as one thing, but they'll also look at the team and the person in place bringing the product to, to market uh, uh, to really make that decision of, am I going to give them $10,000 or am I not going to give them $10,000? Okay. So again, something else to think about uh, when we go through the exercise. Um, and then finally, the self-expressive benefits. So we all have our favorite brands that we love to wear. You know, I see the, the 10 tree sweater in the background, in the back there, and that's because, you know, I like buying it because they plant trees, right? Every, for every sweater or, or shirt or whatever is planted, they plant 10 trees. And as a consumer, I like that fact, and it draws me to that brand, and I'm gonna buy that sweater over maybe a Nike sweater because I know that it's gonna have that environmental feel good, uh, social, uh, social uh, component to it. All right, or the same reason why people buy designer brands, you know, your Gucci, your Prada, your Louis Vuitton. Um, they want to express themselves a certain way and those brands carry with them that expression, right? So that's how I want to conduct myself. That's how I want to carry myself. I'm going to gravitate, gravitate towards those brands that allow me to do that. And again, that's part of your value proposition of your product or your service and eventually that brand that you're building, okay? 
Um, so again, another, uh, another example, you walk into a home hardware or you walk into a Lowe's. It's that can-do attitude, it's that do-it-yourself attitude that kind of permeates through uh, their, their store. Again, so it's about uh, who, who you're targeting um, and how they want to feel, how, how do they want to interact with your brand, how do they want to express themselves by purchasing your brand. And you really have to think, think this through. And a lot of this stuff will actually come from understanding who your target customer is. If your target customer is young girls between the ages of 13 and 16, um, they're going to want certain color palettes, they're going to want certain, uh, your website to interact a certain way, they're going to expect different things from you than if you are a Lowe's or a Home Depot, right, who is probably catering more towards the 30 to 55 year old man, right? So who is your target customer? And that will actually dictate a lot of how you build in the, the self-expressive benefits and the emotional benefits of the, the, those things. The utility really doesn't change unless it's, unless you're, um, unless you're building, you know, unless it's a new software product or a new app or, or allows you to, you, you're building a, a car or a robot that does something that couldn't be done before, right? That's when the utility and the functional piece really comes in. But even then, the companies buying that robot or whatever from you still have to have that trust in your brand. They're buying your robot versus someone else's robot because that they know that the service that they get uh, from you is, is first class. They know that uh, if anything breaks, you're gonna be right there for them or that it doesn't break. That's, that's, that's one of the, the benefits of using yours as well. Okay, a great exercise to go through with this is number one, create an avatar. So we've all done it playing video games. We've dressed the person up, we've, we've you know, selected what they want to look like, their color, all that kind of stuff, what, what clothes they're wearing. So go through this exercise. So if you have a business uh, idea in mind, you have a product in mind, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on you. So woodworking, who is your target customer? Who do you think is your target customer? Uh, 30 to 55 year old, a bit of extra money. Exactly, right? Because they, they want a handcrafted product, they want something quality. It's going to be that kind of, that, that, that income bracket that's a little uh, middle class plus, right? Um, so then how do you market yourself to that, to that demographic? Yeah, okay, so that's, what I'm gonna, that's a good answer. All right, because how you, because based on where your product fits in that market or who your target customer is, it changes how my marketing uh, is, is um, how, how I, I promote myself, how I market myself online, the kind of persona that I might take online. What does my Twitter account, my Instagram account, my Facebook account take on that persona of my brand? And that's very different depending on the age group or the people that you're interacting with, right? I'm getting a little off of value proposition, but it's all part, kind of part and parcel, okay? So that when you are going through it and you're cre creating that value proposition, you always have that target customer in mind. Another great exercise to do is uh, a day in the life. So you have that customer, you have that, 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 target, that target client. Um, what is their regular day status quo? What is, your, what is their regular day without your product, your service in their daily life? All right, what problems do they face? How do they go through it? And then create a scenario where your character now has purchased or interacted with uh, your service, your brand, your product. How has their life changed? What problem did you solve? And why are they happier that you solved it? All right. This is not necessarily to paint the picture in your head, but to paint the picture in other people's head that there is a problem that exists and I am solving it with my product, my service, and brand. So that's the value proposition. And the reason why we start with the value proposition is because it really does form the backbone of your business model canvas. So that's the big sheet that you have in front of you here. All right, so we're gonna get into that a little bit and we're gonna talk about each of the different sections and then again, you'll have that opportunity to work on it uh, uh, after a few minutes here. So we've all heard of business models, we've all seen business plans, working with startups uh, when they're changing all the time. I'm a big proponent of flexible and lean, okay? And that's exactly what the business model canvas is. It's very flexible, it keeps everything very simple and concise so you're lean and it's all right there at your fingertips. You don't have to go flip to page 33 to find what my marketing uh, you know, what, what my marketing strategy is going to be. Um, literally, I've been to different incubators and accelerators from uh, across Canada, and a lot of the, the startups, they have it 
post it on the wall behind them or on their whiteboard so that they can change it as things go, as things go right? Because again, when we're thinking about startups, it's you know, resembling that science experiment. We're testing our hypotheses, we're, we're, we're checking our assumptions, we're doing our market research, and we're coming back to the drawing board with, with our findings, right? And that's what the business model canvas allows you to do. And because the regional business center is in here, I can say that that template that they provide is fantastic if you're a small and medium enterprise. It's a little much to work through if you're a startup and you've just got an idea and I'm just trying to get going. All right, so this will let you put all those ideas on one place without having to fill out a 30 page template. Um, but what it really boils down to is uh, the business model describes the value an organization offers to its customers and illustrates the capabilities and resources required to create, market, and deliver this value. So you spend all this time working on that value proposition. The business model canvas or the business model now takes that value proposition and expands on it to say that, you know, I'm going to make this product and I'm going to sell it and that's how I'm going to make money. That's great. How are you going to build a product? How are you going to market it? What's the transaction look like? Uh, who are your customers? Right? How, what's my marketing strategy? All that other kind of stuff is baked into that kind of three-step process that really isn't quite a three-step process. Okay. And then a big part of this too is it forces you to think about the costs and the finances associated with starting your startup. A lot of people get lost in the idea and how great the product's going to be and it's going to change people's lives, but it's got to make financial sense and it's got to be sustainable. So I need to know how many units I've got to move a day, a week, a month to make sure that I can cover my costs. And then what are my costs? Well, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm uh, operating a website, that's 20 bucks a month right there just for the hosting fees. That doesn't even count if I'm paying for Shopify to handle my e-commerce ba back end, right? That's not my bookkeeper. That's not the time I might spend with a lawyer uh, talking about intellectual property. That's not a whole bunch of things. And we need to figure out what those costs are. Again, so you can set that price point of your product or your service or figure out how you're going to be lean enough to actually make money on, on selling that product or service. All right. And again, the canvas uh, is great because it, you can iterate on it all the time. So uh, unfortunately tonight I don't have sticky notes, but one of the best things to do is actually go through this exercise using uh, post-it notes because you can post them on, you can walk away, have a coffee, come back 20 minutes later and say, you know what, that's not quite right and I can change them really easy. Uh, for tonight's purposes, I mean draw all over it. Um, but it, that, that's something you can do at home or you can blow it up on, on big printer paper or you can put it on a whiteboard. Uh, but it's great because you can test those ideas. You can get those, those, those thoughts of yours uh, onto, the, onto the piece of paper and you can change it real quickly and see how different things maybe interact with one another. An organization's business model can be described with nine basic building blocks. Your customer segments, your value proposition for each segment, the channels to reach customers, customer relationships you establish, the revenue streams you generate, the key resources and key activities you require to create value, the key partners, and the cost structure of the business model. But it's not sufficient to just enumerate the nine building blocks. What you really want to do is to map them out on a pre-structured canvas. This is what we call the business model canvas, a tool that helps you map, discuss, design and invent new business models. Let's briefly go through the nine building blocks, starting with the customer segments. These are all the people or organisations for which you're creating value. This includes simple users and paying customers. For each segment, you have a specific value proposition. These are the bundles of products and services that create value for your customers. The channels describe through which touch points you're interacting with customers and delivering value. The customer relationships outline the type of relationship you're establishing with your customers. Revenue streams make clear how and through which pricing mechanisms your business model is capturing value. Then you need to describe the infrastructure to create, deliver and capture value. The key resources show which assets are indispensable in your business model. The key activities show which things you really need to be able to perform well. The key partners show who can help you leverage your business model, since you won't own all key resources yourself. 
nor you perform all key activities. Then once you understand your business model's infrastructure, you'll also have an idea of its cost structure. So with the business model canvas, you can map out your entire business model in one image. This works for startup entrepreneurs just as well as for the most senior executives. Perfect. So there's also that piece there at the end, you know, for executives or, or people already working in business. So it works well for startups, but also if you're already working in a company or you're going through some kind of new product or service kind of brain, brainstorm or brain jam, um, the Business Model Canvas is also a great tool for that as well uh, because, again, it lets you get those ideas down on paper. If you're already working with a company, uh, it's much easier to kind of figure out what resources you, ha you have and then also what ones you need to, you need to maybe access or bring, on, uh, bring into your company uh, to make that product or service happen. But for a startup, uh, it really is more about what do I need right now and how can I execute on it. So again, the value proposition worked on this a little bit. What is the central piece? It's the central piece. Um, how you plan to bind the supply side with the demand side. So. Who are my customers and how am I going to service them, right? Again, who are your target customers? That, that little scenario, create that avatar, create that character. Uh, that's where this comes in. Uh, maybe something to include in there too is what's their motivation to buy your product or service or brand? Customer relationships. Again, so what is that feel? What is that experience that you want your customer to have when they're interacting with you, when they're interacting with an employee, when they walk into your storefront, or when they uh, visit your website, right? First impression, who's had a bad first impression on a website? And you said, I'm never going visiting this website again. I'm not buying products because it was just too hard to work through, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, if you don't make that first impression, which is kind of what this customer relationship piece comes back to, uh, it's really hard to continue doing business. Also as part of this is what does that transaction look like? So this is important. So thinking lawn care, is it, am I coming back once a month? Am I coming back every two weeks? Am I just doing a one-off job, right? What, how, what, what does my business model look like for each of those scenarios? Um, if I'm selling a car, right? There's all sorts of service work that comes with it. So you buy the one, you have one big uh, purchase up front and a whole bunch of little transactions afterwards because of the service that's involved. Um, if I'm buying a house, well, it's, it's not going anywhere. It's kind of just the house, it's just that one kind of, that one big purchase and then I kind of, I don't walk away from it because I'm living in it, but I walk away from that purchase, I'm only buying it the one time, right? So what is that, that the relationship or that, what does that transaction look like that you're having with your customers? Uh, also, too, if, if it's e-commerce, right? So we're, we're thinking about uh, distribution channels. How do you reach your customers? Is it that storefront? Do I actually have a physical space that you're walking into and you're buying products off the shelves? Is it that digital storefront where now you're buying your product through uh, my e-commerce website? All right. And then with that comes a whole bunch of things like how am I taking payments? Um, what services am I using to, to take those payments in? Um, or am I selling something into the mining industry? So we see that a lot here. Are we selling something in the mining industry? I don't really have a huge sales staff. I'm not really sure how to market myself into the mining industry, but I know I have a product that they need. So I'm gonna work with distributors. I'm gonna license my product out. I'm gonna give them a percentage of each sale and incentivize them to sell my product. So that's another, uh, that's another distribution channel. All right, so there's a whole bunch of different ways you can get your product into your customer's hands. And that's what you really need to think about. And that's again why the business model, uh, the, the canvas is so great because you can work through each scenario, right? Key activities, this, this changes over time. All right, so right now as a startup, it is, this is what I need to do today. This is what I need to do tomorrow. This is my to-do list. I need to talk to this person. I need to find out about funding. I need to raise this capital. I need to talk to someone about trademarks. And it's literally just kind of a to-do list. When you, get into the, when you get to the point where you've got employees, you've got the, rev the, the regular revenue stream, um, uh, that becomes, the key activity becomes, what do I have to do every day? What do I have to do every week to make sure that I'm consistently serving my customers, right? So it's not my to-do list isn't, you know, I need to do all these things because I've already done it. It is I need to continue to do these things on a daily or a weekly basis to make sure that 
I continue to generate revenue. I continue to have those customer relationships. Um, key resources. Uh, if you're a tech startup, we're a key resource. If you're looking to raise capital, well, money's gonna be a key resource. If you have to source materials to build your product, you gotta find a different uh, textile or um, you actually have to get something made or, or machined, who are, you, who are you using, where are you sourcing that from, okay? Key partners, again, so who, who is gonna help you along the way? If you're, if you're building something and you're gonna distribute it, then your distrib one of your distributors is gonna be a partner. If you're working through Startup 101 and you've got a tech startup, then, then NORCAD is a partner for you. If you're not, then maybe the Regional Business Center is a partner for you. And there's kind of different classes of partners you, you can kind of see already taking shape. I, if I have a lawyer, I have a bookkeeper, I have, um, uh, I don't know, someone, something else, someone doing my marketing, right? Those are all kind of service providers that are gonna be my partners. You're paying them, but they still wanna kind of have that partner relationship with them, right? Uh, again, your cost structure. What do I need to sell, hey Kirk, what do I need to sell um, my product at to make sure that I'm making money? And is it, again, is it a subscription? Is it that one-time buy? Is there service built into it? What does that cost? What is my cost structure? What does my product look like? How am I selling it? Uh, revenue streams, same, same kind of thing. So the cost structure is more of, I've got to spend this much money to, to build the product, this much money, it cost me this much money in materials, it cost me, it cost me this much money to uh, market the product, therefore I have to sell it at this amount of money to make sure that I've got, my margins are big enough to cover everything. Revenue streams are more of, um, I'm gonna make money by selling it to this person, I'm gonna be make it by selling it to bulk to this distributor who is then gonna sell more of it, um, or I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna sell it and then I'm gonna service it. So where are, where, where are the different revenue streams coming from? The best way I've seen uh, to actually work through this exercise is to give yourself, literally time it, 20 to 30 minutes, scribble as much as you can down, get as much of your thoughts down, jump around from the page, on the page, so when you think of something, immediately jump to that section, and then when the timer goes off, stop, breathe, take a break, and then come back to it. All right, give it five, 10 minutes or so, so that you come back with a fresh, uh, with, a, with a kind of a fresh perspective, and then go at it again, until you think you've hit on something that really is gonna work for you, or at the very least, you can come to someone like me, or a mentor, or an advisor, or something like that, and say, I think I'm on the right path, I'd, like, I'd love to have your advice on this now, okay? And literally this is one of the first things that we ask the startups that we work with to do is go through the business model canvas and then when you're going to be introduced or you're connected with that mentor, they're gonna have, they have that expectation that you're gonna sit down with them and actually have that business model canvas ready to go so that they know that you've done some homework, you've thought about it for a little bit and you've actually tried some things and you think you, you've got that business model laid down.